emergency meeting pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, Section 8, and Emergency Order Number 12, Section 3. I had to think about that for a moment because I'd rather be back in person with everybody. Me so, too. Uh, Mrs. Johnson is present. Ms. Brown? Present. Ms. Oden? Here. And we have with us Mr. Donovan and Ms. Gingrich. Okay. okay. Um, the first thing on our agenda is the athletic training contract. Yes, and we have Lisa here to speak to that. Okay. Um, Dan, did you want to speak to anything about the contract or you just want me to talk about the, the relationship and what they do? Yeah, why don't you do that first and then we okay. can talk the numbers after that. Okay, so before you, you have a, an updated contract um, for potentially the next three years for the athletic training services for the two high schools with Performance Rehab Inc. of Nashua. Performance and the Nashua School District have had a relationship for more than 32 years. Jerry Holland and his wife, Michelle, are the owners of Rehab performance rehab and started offering training services to our high school in 1989. As part of the contract, the um, performance rehab will offer, provide, that's the word I'm looking for, sorry, provide 20 hours a week of a athletic trainer or certified athletic trainer at each of the two high schools. It's important to know that these employees are full-time employees of performance rehab. Even though the contract states they work 20 hours for us, they put in well beyond that. Um, some weeks it may be as much as 30 or 40 hours a week in addition to performance, their time at the clinic at performance rehab. In addition to those two athletic trainers at each of the high schools, we also have access to Jerry and his wife, who are also certified athletic trainers. So often at events, you'll see not only the North or South trainer, but you'll also see Jerry. Um, in addition to that, we always have per diem coverage. So there are times we may have a hockey game and a basketball game and a wrestling meet going on at both buildings. So our trainers, including Jerry and his staff will often help provide us an additional coverage person for that. Our two trainers at the two high schools are have always been very, very responsive to our students and our parents and our coaches that it's not just you know, the time that you see them on the court at a basketball game, for instance, they are contacting parents about any injuries. They are responding to parents and students about injuries. I can think very specifically about a recent injury we had, we had where our self trainer was corresponding with our one of our local orthopedics, orthopedist over the weekend, making an appointment for a student to be seen first thing Monday morning. So they're in constant contact, even though the contract specifies 20 hours for each high school, it is well beyond that. They treat students for injuries, they follow up with parents and students, as well as they perform some rehabilitation in, in their training offices at each high school. Jerry and Performance Rehab also coordinate and provide volunteer orthopedic coverage at all of our home football games. So we have a, an orthopedist on the sideline at every one of our home games at Stelos. And our two trainers and Jerry and his wife has also been instrumental in securing and coordinating for us our neuropsychologist consultant who reads and consults on all of our impact testing and our con concussions. And just as a closing statement, our trainers um, right now, each of the trainers at the two high schools, as well as the entire performance rehab staff, they have the health and safety of our athletes in their hands. They deal with injuries. Concussions are always um, a hot topic. Not only do they assess concussions, diagnose concussions, but they also follow through the return to play protocol post concussion. And then obviously with everything that we have all been dealing with since March, 
They are also consulting on COVID protocols as well as the return to play after any of our student athletes have tested positive for COVID. Um, there's some implications there. And one of the biggest things that I think in the entire COVID situation is our athletic trainers have put themselves at risk by being with all of our student athletes. You know, each team is their own little cohort, but our athletic trainers <clears throat> every cohort. Um, so that's just a little bit about what they do. I know Dan's gonna talk specifically about the, the details of the contract itself. And before uh, Mr. Donovan, you speak, I just wanna let the record show that Mr. Smith has joined the meeting. Okay, um, this is a three-year contract. Uh, the previous contract we had was also for three years. Uh, it gives uh, gives a little more comfort that we, we're not doing this every single year. As Lisa said, we've had a long-term relationship with this group. The increases in the contract are 1% are for next year. Um, and two and a half percent for the next two years after that. Um, the history of the increases, um, they've averaged the previous six years, they've averaged like 1.2 percent. So they've worked with us during the difficult times. Um, and uh, as Lisa said, we get we get a lot of bang for the buck. So uh, in my opinion, I I would uh, suggest that we approve this contract. Can I just add one thing to that, Dan? Um, prior to the previous three-year contract that's expiring this June, there was seven years that they received no increases at all. Um, so they're, they're generous of their time, for sure. Does any, any members of the committee have any questions? Ms. Oden. Thank you. I, do other um, school districts have athletic trainers? Yes, a lot of school districts do have athletic trainers. Um, the majority of the, the schools that we compete against with, obviously the largest high schools, the division one schools, everybody has at least one full-time trainer. And by full-time, I refer to a similar situation as we have. Many of the schools contract with a company much like we do. There are a few schools that the school district themselves hire the athletic trainer. So it's a school district employee, um, but that is pretty rare. You will find some of the smaller school districts um, do not have their own trainer and they'll just contract out for specific sports such as hockey and football. But the majority, I would say the larger schools and well, most of the schools probably from the Rafe Lakes region South either have their own or contract like we do. I, I ask this question because in the fifth paragraph, uh, uh, the second Second sentence says, the opposition school's coach will be advised of the ATC's recommendations for any injury to one of their athletes. The opposing coach assumes all liability if he, she disregards the ATC's recommendation. And I was just wondering if they have their own, why are, why is our athletic athletic trainer stepping in there. Yep. Dottie, what page was that on? It's on the first page. Okay. Sorry. It's the fifth paragraph down. I'm sorry. I didn't. I... That's okay. Um, so for instance, athletic trainers don't travel to away events um, mm. other than mostly football. So they will train because of the high risk. They will tr uh, travel for football, but not all schools will also travel for football. So let's take a different sport. For example, we're in the middle of hockey season. So I'll use that for an example. So when we have a home hockey game, we are required by NHIA bylaw to provide an athletic trainer or medical staff of some kind on site. 
So if our opponent has an injury at that point in time, then our athletic trainer will assess and treat the injury on site at that point in time. So I believe what that paragraph is referring to is on site in the middle of a game. If our athletic trainer tells the coach, you know, Dan Donovan torn ACL shouldn't play the rest of the game and the coach chooses to ignore that then I believe that paragraph is releasing our trainers from the liability at that point and putting it upon the coach. So I believe that's what it's referring to. Okay. So let me ask this. When our uh, athletic teams uh, go to another school district to play, do the athletic trainers go with them or do they use the athletic trainer at the away site? Bill, the only sport that our athletic trainers travel with our teams to away events are for football. Often our trainers will also travel if our team makes it deep into the playoffs and there are no other events going on. A lot of times they'll travel then. So likewise, if, you know, North boys basketball is traveling to Concord for a game during that game, it's the Concord athletic trainer that has medical jurisdiction over that event. So our coaches you know, we have that conversation with our coaches that whoever's, whoever's the medical staff on duty, you listen to them, basically. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that, Lisa. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I'm done. Is there any Johnson. other questions? I've got a question. Um, how is our athletic program doing right now? Where are we with the program in the winter sports? So we are up and operational. We have played two or three ice hockey teams, depending which one, excuse me, two or three ice hockey games where I believe four or five basketball games in other than our South girls varsity team. They had a a COVID quarantine, so they will be opening up hopefully tomorrow night should have opened up tonight, but the snow had other plans for them. Um, Our teams are, they're practicing, they're playing, they're competing against other schools. So we're up, we're up and running. Okay, so you see us semi-normal other than COVID, kind of getting there. Semi-normal, semi-normal. Yeah, just, kids kids are in the just, buildings, kids are practicing. Um, our COVID protocols are very strict. So kids are wearing masks, very limited spectators, but we are, we're up and running. You know, I love hearing this. I just can't understand why we can't do this in the classroom, but we're doing this for sports. We're giving kids at least something to look forward to. So, okay. Would anybody like to make a motion to accept the athletic uh, training contract? Question, Ms. Johnson? Sure. I I actually do want to accept the contract. um, Do both high schools have equal access to the trainers and the number of hours at each Yes, each high school has its own. Um, So each, there are two separate people, one every day when they're done their hours at the clinic reports to South, the other when he's done his hours at the clinic, he reports to North. Yes. Excellent, I'm glad to hear that. And honestly, I think having a trainer or, you know, having a contract with a trainer is really important. Um, The intensity of sports has ramped up over the last several years and the awareness of, Concussion protocols has really ramped up, which in a, in a good way. I'm I'm glad to hear that. So I think this is very valuable. So thank you. I will support it. And the then only, the only thing I would like to see eventually, I don't know when we can do this, but to get some sort of training coverage at our middle schools, because as you say, the the intensity of sports is changing, and we just we don't have the coverage. We don't have the bodies. Um, to cover our middle school events. But at some point down the road, I'd love to see even if there was one that shared all three middle schools or or one and a half or or two that share the three middle schools or something. So, but that's down the road, not in this contract. That's great. (laughs) All right. Thanks, Mrs. Johnson. That was my question. Okay, not a problem. Okay, so the motion on the table is to accept the athletic training coverage contract for Nashua High School School District um, for the period of August 2021 through June 2024. So moved. Thank you. Will there be a second? I'll second. Okay. Mrs. Johnson votes yes. 
Ms. Oden? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Motion carries. Great. Thank you, everybody. You're welcome. Thank you, Lisa. Have a good night. You too. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the flooring contract award. Uh, Mr. Smith, did you want to talk about this? Uh, yes, please, and good evening, everybody. Um, so we reached out to three vendors for th three separate pieces of work. Um, they're listed on the uh, memorandum they submitted. So we want to replace the carpet in the South High School Media Center. That carpet dates back to 2004. Uh, the, the North High School Auditorium dates back to 2002. And the Amherst Street Library or Media Center dates back to 1999. Uh, those are actually young carpets, as we tend to see in the school district. Uh, but they are in high traffic areas, do have rips, and they do need to be replaced. So we requested bids from three companies, as you'll see from the attachment. Uh, one decided not to uh, bid after everybody saw the, the it was taken to each of the three locations. So I'm recommending, uh, so basically it was National Wallpaper and uh, Cardoza Flooring were the two bidding companies. I'm recommending we award the work at the uh, South High School Media Center to National Wallpaper in the amount of $37,460. Uh, at the North High School Auditorium to Cardoza Flooring, the amount of $18,058.80. And Amherst Street Media Center, also to Cardoza Flooring, the amount of $12,364.95. All of those uh, were planned and were budgeted out of deferred maintenance. And I request that we approve those. Just as an aside, as far as flooring goes, we also plan to replace carpet at the Birch Hill main office and main Dunstable office, and also a portion of the South High School principal's office. But that work will be done with in-house labor and come out of our major repairs line, which uh, are also in the budget. Okay, so Mr. Smith, so the last ones you're talking about isn't on this list, right? That's correct, that's correct. Okay, so here's a couple of my questions here. Um, now, we're, did you say replacing this with flooring or we're gonna put carpeting back down? We're actually going to go with carpet squares, which I wanna to switch to that method of carpeting because as, as you can probably imagine, like in front of the circulation desk at any library, that's where you're gonna have the major wear on the carpet whereas other areas of the library, it doesn't get as much wear and tear. So in each case, the carpet is being replaced by carpet. And in each case, they're with carpet squares. Okay, have we ever thought about putting in flooring which lasts longer? Um, well, in the media, both media centers, you want a, a material that's sound deadening as well. Um, we all remember the librarian going, shh, when we're too noisy uh, and just the foot traffic is so that's so that's the reason in the libraries kind of the same thing in the auditorium though because you're having performances you don't want to hear, hear the sound of feet running across the floor um, the only other thing I could think of we might possibly replace it with would be a sort of a rubberized tile uh, but that would be more expensive than this okay um, and on these, do we ever get to see the bids themselves or do we just get to see what you've picked and not be able to read the bids? I could, yeah, that, I mean, that's the reason why I summarize them for you in the, on the spreadsheet, but absolutely we could provide the bids in the future if you want. Yeah, yeah. I would. I think we should really be able to, you know, kind of see exactly what the bids came out to be and what exactly they're proposing. Um, in the bid and kind of line it up with your summary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I've always been given bids in the past for us to take a look at. Okay, I can certainly do that. I mean, of late, we've done it this way, but if you want to see the bids, we can certainly provide those. Sure. Is there any questions from the committee? Ms. Brown? 
since you're doing the carpet squares, um, I'm assuming that as the area, the high traffic areas get, um, as they wear down, you'll be replacing just that section moving forward as opposed to the re redoing the whole floor. Correct. Yeah, I think this will actually save money in the long term because you're just replacing it where you really need to replace it. Awesome. And um, have we kind of double checked to make sure that um, whatever carpet squares you're using are going to be something that's going to be manufactured for a while so we kind of match it up? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and typically what I do with project like this, I have something called attic stock where they provide some extra tiles. I don't recall off the top of my head if we did that in this case, but I can certainly buy that on my operating budget. Thank you. Is there any other questions, Ms. Oden? No, I, I just want to make a comment that all of these winning bids for the low bids for the projects. Thank you, Ms. Oden. I appreciate that. Any other comments, questions? Okay. I'm going to make a motion to recommend recommendation to the award floor award flooring contracts to for Nashua High School South. Media Center to Nashua Wallpaper in the amount of $37,460. Nashua High School North Auditorium to Cadoza Flooring in the amount of $18,058.80. Amherst Street Media Center to Cadoza Flooring in the amount of $12,364.95, not to exceed any of these amounts. Do I have a second? Okay. Ms. Brown? Yep. Okay. Okay. And Mrs. Johnson votes yes. Ms. Oden? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Okay. Motion carries. Okay. I'm just taking some notes here. Okay, the next item on the agenda is Allied Universal three-year service contract for all security equipment. Um, Mr. Smith? Yes, uh, so our, we were in the tail end of a service contract uh, to Allied, uh, which expires, uh, actually expires October 30, excuse me, August 31st of this year. Um, as I was in the middle of the budget process, I asked for um, a, a good estimate for what they thought it would be for next coming year. And I, I use that number in our next year's budget. Um, it was very close to what this number is. Uh, so this is for a three-year project, a uh, three-year contract. They provide the maintenance for all of our security needs. Um, the They found that the price was escalating really more than they were comfortable with. So they've suggested that we take out our security cameras out of the project. Uh, this past year, they worked on uh, 15 cameras, ended up uh, having to replace two of them and uh, repaired the other 13. Um, so they suggested that that's one way of controlling the increase. We agreed to that. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a good move on our part. So the, the overall contract is uh, basically a 2% per year increase, except that's been averaged over the three years. Uh, I think that's reasonable. Um, just for some more information, the uh, we've had Panasonic cameras, we've switched to other brand. All these cameras were installed in, in 2013 when we had the two and a half million dollar security project in the school district. Um, and they are starting to fail. We, again, we switched to a different brand. Um, there is an, if you read the contract, you can see exactly what they're doing. I would note in this service contract, they listed Brentwood as uh, one of the sites that they'll be servicing. Obviously that will probably be changing uh, this fall to uh, 55 Franklin Street. I expect that will be a, a minor increase in cost uh, just because of the Brent, uh, Franklin Street's uh, larger than what we have at Brentwood. Um, but I think it's a good deal. It saves us a lot of time and, and effort and money. I recommend approval. Um, it's, so the annual amount is uh, $100,374.96. Uh, 
And uh, bottom of the memo, we list the budget line. It is something we have budgeted, uh, 91.1, 22, 26, 20, 53, 680, 28. And I'll take any questions. Ms. Brown? Um, just to clarify about the cameras, you said they were being removed. That's only if they're broken or damaged. We're not actually removing the security service. Correct. And, and even with the cameras, they will, if it's possible to replace them, I mean, sorry, if it's possible to repair them, they will. But, but the issue with those cameras, uh, even though it's only been eight years, is sometimes the repair parts just aren't available. And those are the cases they'll have to replace them and we'll um, have to pay for that, but that'll be separate. Yeah, that, I would expect that. That type of technology improves and changes so quickly. Yes. So I'm not, I wouldn't expect that. Okay. And um, what, are, what are you expecting when we add on the Franklin Street building, um, I mean, at square footage and the build, the entrances and exits of that building are gonna be quite different. Do you think there's gonna be a large increase there? Um, so Franklin Street has really three entrances uh, on the on the Franklin Street side, on the, the side street, and then the back side, which is the handicap accessible. So uh, we we just have one entrance basically that we're paying for now. So a, a thousand, two thousand tops would be the increase. All right. Thank you, Ms. Oden. Do you have any questions? Okay. Um, here it says um, that the Panasonic cameras that have been discontinued, um, okay, Allied will no longer be responsible for replacing and repairing Panasonic cameras that have been discontinued where parts are no longer available. So if these cameras break, do we have the money in the budget to replace these cameras for new cameras? Yes, actually, uh, you'll, you'll, coming attractions, you will see a, a line in the budget for security um, that will cover that cost. Okay. And I get it that we have three entrances, a thousand. Maybe we can negotiate that we won't have to pay them anything extra in the first year of the contract because um, who knows how many kids are going to be actually in school. We haven't set anything in stone yet how school's going to progress. And when exactly is Brentwood going to be moved over? Do we have any plans exactly when? Because we paid on the lease for this year for 21-22. Uh, Are we going to be moving them in the middle of the lease and breaking a lease? No, that, that I guess Mr. Dunneman could probably answer that better. But uh, to my knowledge, that lease expires on June 30th. So we'll be moving the program on July okay. 1st. So uh, there is no overlap. Did I say that right, Dan? That's correct. The lease ends June 30th of this year at okay. the current facility. And will the building be ready for them, at least Brentwood to move into there? Uh, I, I believe so. It, it's um, especially for Brentwood. I think that's our first priority. Uh, a lot of the preschools already can, sort of have a home. We're just taking them out of the elementary schools. But our intention is to have both programs there by the beginning of school. The uh, architect uh, contract that you approved last night, full board it was a major step in, in making that happen because they have to prepare the plans and specifications that will enable us to get the permits to make the changes we have to make. Okay, and let me just bring this up. We have an update on my um, agenda about Franklin Street tonight. Are you gonna be giving us any update on that? Tonight. I think yeah, between Dan and I will be doing that. Yeah, because I've got I've got a couple of questions on the bidding process here. I've looked that up. Thank you, uh, Ms. Brown. You have a question? Actually, it's it's no big deal. Actually, I'm going to save it for the Franklin Street um, update. That's good. Okay. I'm actually I'm very supportive of the work we're doing over at Brentwood. I think, um, and I think right now most of the kids in that program are going to school full time as well. I so see we're servicing those kids in a really powerful way. Okay, any other questions on this, Ms. Oden? Okay, I'm gonna make a motion to approve the contract for Allied Universal three-year service agreement for all security equipment. Do I, anybody wanna make a motion on that? I'll so moved. Ms. Oden, do you want a second? 
Yes, I'll second. Okay, Ms. Johnson votes yes. Ms. Oden? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Okay, motion carries. I'm gonna kind of go out of order from my questions to the Franklin Street. So uh, Mr. Smith doesn't have to stay if he doesn't want to after. We can have the update. Mr. Smith likes staying though. Does he? <laughs> we can extend the meeting to four hours if he really likes to be with us. But sometimes this is better than uh, network TV. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it is. <laughs> okay, the I'll sort of start at the Franklin Street update. There's nothing written because I was we were hoping to have a, a few things um, done by now that didn't quite happen, but. Um, I, I do have a meeting tomorrow between attorneys on both sides. The church that owns um, the facility and and us. So that's at I believe one o'clock tomorrow. We should be wrapping up any um, final questions and setting a closing date. The title search has been completed, um, and it then led to a couple of. Um, items that needed to be cleared up. The church was in the process of doing that. My understanding is that has been completed, um, but obviously that'll be confirmed by the lawyers at closing. Um, so the plan will be to close based on tomorrow. Hopefully I'll have a date, but by the middle of this month, um, we will then based on the uh, contract that was approved last night, uh, get the architects in there and start the process. Um, as Mr. Smith mentioned, we the the main uh, goal will be to get the Brentwood program in there on the on the top floor, uh, as they will not have a space um, effective June thirtieth. I have been in contact with the um, owners of the facility they're currently in and told them there's 90% chance we will not be coming back. Um, and so if we can get all this done in the next uh, month or so, that gives Mr. Smith and his staff a lot of time to spend so that we can do a lot of this work internally, um, painting and floor tiles and, and ceilings, any of those types of things we can do internally at a much cheaper price than we can contracting that out. Um, as Mr. Smith mentioned, the security camera work will have to be done by an outside service. The fire alarm panels and all that uh, safety related stuff would obviously be done by an outside firm also. Um, but we've, we've talked about this um, a number of times, and we think if we can get this in the next month, and I think Mr. Smith can speak to this when when I stop speaking, but I think we should we, we're pretty comfortable we'll be able to have the students in there um, come the first of September or potentially a week or so before that. Sean, yeah, I think uh, actually a couple of board of med members have mentioned they'd like to see the facility. Mm -hmm. I think once we're in possession of it. And we can certainly set that up and give you a tour of the place. You'll, you'll find that it's actually in, in looks, it's a very good shape. Uh, it was a school before. Um, there are some things we really need to do, but uh, they're primarily cosmetic, with the exception of the life safety things. Um, the other thing we have to do is put the handicap accessibility uh, at the main entrance and probably just redo that and hold main entrance, which is, is similar to the security vestibule work we've done uh, this past summer and fall in various elementary schools. So I'm confident we can get it done and just need to uh, have possession and start working. Any questions? Uh, uh, can, I, can I just make a comment? I know a while back we, the board received an email from somebody concerned about right. Franklin Street and they made uh, the point that there was no playground there for the students. And I spoke with Miss Bagley. She said there is uh, room there for a playground. They just don't have the equipment at that at this point. So that was one of the concerns somebody raised. But in fact, there there will be when we get the 
playground equipment in, we will have a playground for students. So I just wanted to clarify that. That was included in our budget estimate, uh, providing a suitable playground for preschool kids. Thank you. There actually, sorry, there was one there, <laughs> but the oh. church, uh, without really talking to us, but it was never part of the deal. They took out all the equipment that they had in place. You know, unless you put it in writing, it all has to be in writing, what they're gonna take and what they're gonna give you. Yep. Um, I wanna talk about last night's um, bid process here because I've looked up in the in our policy and with the state we had to have a bid process here we had to have at least three bids the bids should have come to us they should have been sealed addressed to the board that did not happen so I feel in my opinion we circumvented the bidding process here last night and I, I just don't understand why I understand it had to be done but why wasn't, did we request at least three bids, presented it to the committee and brought it then to the full board? I've got it in the policy and it's hard for me to read anything because it's on my phone. It's um, purchasing procedures, DJB. It makes it very clear, states makes it clear, the feds make it clear about the bidding process, that didn't happen. So how do we know that somebody else couldn't have had a better bid than who we're using right now for the middle schools? And I mentioned that last night, nobody listened to me, but it's clear in the policy. So we violated the policy last night. And that's why I voted against it. They could have been the best person for the job, but it was not done correctly last night. And Ms. Raymond said it needs to come to committee. And when it doesn't come to committee, we can't talk about it the way it should be spoken about these process, just like we did with these contracts. And maybe some of the new board members don't understand that there's a bid process here. It's very clear, the Board of Aldermen is supposed to do it. Joint Special School Building Committee is supposed to do the same thing. Supposed to have three bids, at least three bids, if you can get the three bids. If you can't, then there's a reason, we're known that you can't, but we're supposed to be able to see the bids. So I'm putting this out, I would, I would ask for us to redo it, but I know I'd be on the losing end of it again to go back and ask for three bids and then be brought to the board properly. But my myself as a board member shouldn't have to be bringing this up to administration. Well, if so I, I could, just want on the if record. I could just speak one thing to that. Um, when we're talking bids for professional services, when we do do bids, it's we have to, it's not always low price. Okay, we okay. have to we have to base it on that the group has the skills and the experience, and we know who they are and the work they've done. So, as I mentioned last night, JSSBC had done the same thing with two contracts. We just we just did a bid with this group, and they won the middle school project. So we went through the whole process this was sort of looked upon as sort of just an add-on to that whole process in my mind. Now, maybe I'm incorrect, but um, this was not the purchase of a bunch of computers that we would definitely go out and get prices every single time. This was a known entity. We needed someone to do the work quickly. Um, and they are, are they did win the bid for the middle school project that was only about a year and a half ago. Um, sometimes we, if, if we want, we could do bids and say for the next three years, we would like an architect. And then we could assign that architect multiple projects. We don't have to bid every single project. Um, so in, in my mind, professional services are slightly different from some of the other things. Well, I sat and listened to a whole thing with the Board of Aldermen about bidding processes. Yeah. And in my mind, they bid on a middle school project. This is a completely different project. And no, you don't have to take the lowest bid. Um, you usually do, but you don't have to. I'm not talking about price on this. I think it would have been a better um, clarification if this came to our committee first and if we did have some bids so we as a board could see 
um, who's bidding out. This has nothing to do with the middle school. This is a separate entity. This is for the Franklin Street um, School. With that said, I just wanted to make sure my comments are on the record because I'm not happy about that at all. Um, Mr. Smith, Mr. Donovan, anything else on the Franklin Street update? No, that's it. I'll have, hopefully we'll have more information next month when everything is uh, moving in the right direction. Perfect, thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is my questions that I think everybody got here. Um, special education students in school, while the cleaning is being done, how many, do we know exactly how many students are basically in each school at this point in time? Anybody know? I don't personally know by school, no. Okay. So we should be able to get a better handle. Well, hopefully they're going back to school on the 15th next week, somewhere around then, that the numbers won't change. I'm just kind of curious. I'm just trying to justify, you know, our custodians with all the work that's being done, kids in school, and to, because people ask me a lot of questions about um, people in school, what are they doing, the custodians? So that's why I keep asking questions because I want to get updates all the time. I'm very consistent about what I do. So, so we don't know about how many students are in the school for special ed at this point in time. We can check with Marsha Bagley tomorrow. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I also asked about the, um, how many students since um, November to now have um, left the district? You said to me, Mr. Donovan, we'll get it in the um, budget packet. Yes. Um, next Wednesday, the 17th, we'll roll out the budget. It probably won't be that night, but after that, um, we're currently working on a uh, uh, an analysis showing the difference between the October headcount from a year ago and the October headcount uh, this year and sort of uh, analyzing, we'll let you know basically where most of these students went. Obviously, we did lose some students, but we did not lose 800 students. So we don't put it this way. We don't feel that all those students won't come back next year. Um, it, it's this is a blip year. So, but we'll have, I'll have, like I said, I'll have an analysis, so it'll be a lot easier to talk about with the numbers. Ms. Oden? Yeah, can I just add, we got something in our packet this week uh, that compared school year 2020-21 to 2019-2020, and um, I, what I did, I, I looked at the difference, elementary, we've lost 422 students, middle school, 109 students, and the high school, uh, 61 students, both high schools, and for a total of 592 students. Okay. Yes, and, and like I said, we'll have, we'll have some information on where those students went. Basically, it's three places. Parents kept their kids home for the preschool and kindergarten. We also shut down our preschool program, PayPal's, we didn't have it. Um, more parents homeschooled because the kids couldn't come into school or because of COVID reasons. And the uh, private schools numbers went up. So like I said, we'll, we'll share all that information with you. Okay, um, any other questions, Ms. Owen? No, no, I just- I also asked about if there was any leftover uh, food service money that parents didn't recoup. And you said that um, families can request a refund at any time and some have been reimbursed. The money not requested for reimbursements will be held over and will continue to be avail available for students when they return to school. So have we notified the parents or are they just? I mean, I don't think we've, 
okay. notified the parents that there's money in their accounts. I mean, I okay. think they know there's money in their accounts. But if it were a senior, let's say, that's leaving the district, mm -hmm. we would contact those people. Okay. Most most parents, some have asked for the funds, most have decided just to keep them in there. Okay, the reason I asked that was because we did the bus passes. So we refund that in the parking. So I just wanted to make sure we were consistent that we were refunding any money that um, parents would do. Um, and Mr. Smith, um, so we're, we're caught up with all the work that was usually done in the summertime. And what do we have left now to do in the schools other than sanitizing? Um, yeah, we, we've <laughs> admittedly we're running short on things to do. Uh, okay. Still some painting going on. Uh, when school's starting up, the custodians will uh, be back to their normal cleaning routine. Okay, so what happens if the students are you know, by some horrible chance, they don't get back in the way we want. What are we going to do with the custodians with the remainder of the work? That's a good question. I haven't thought about it. I've been ever hopeful that we'll actually have students back in school. Well, I've been very hopeful since August. Based on the based on the numbers that are showing today, when I looked at it, it it's certain it would be shocking if we weren't back in on Monday. Um, so I think let's let's get to Monday before that's an issue because at this point I don't see it being an issue. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that these students get back into school because that's where they need to be. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. And the last two items on the agenda is the FYI 21 financial report. Thank you, Mr. Smith, for all your help. Appreciate it. Good evening. Have a good night. Bye, Sean. Bye. Okay. Um, so we will start off um, page one. We're going to be looking at the monthly actuals expenditure report, which shows the, the cost by month. Um, and I'll just shoot through quickly, mention a few highlights. Um, Wages full time, you'll notice, is 6.3 million this month. That's because there were two bi weeklies and two weeklies, uh, which was the same thing that happened in November. So you can take a look, and the, the dollar amounts are relatively close in November and January. Uh, December had the three and five of pay, so that's why it was so high. Um, and wages part time is a little lower in January because the uh, First week was a vacation week, the uh, end of the Christmas vacation week, uh, where a lot of that staff uh, didn't work. Um, over time, I'm updating my sheet. As you can see, uh, it's year to date, it's only 69,000. Um, it's much lower than usual, mainly because, well, for two reasons. One, the students aren't in, so there's no, not a need for extra cleaning time and two we're not doing the facility rentals so that usually increases over time most of the overtime that we have in the district is related to the custodians and the tradespeople. um wages mr. per diem mr donovan can i just jump in sure um the overtime why would it be for the custodians over time again it's usually for the custodians when, if somebody's out, somebody's sick, they need okay. to cover the spot. Okay, so did we have a lot of people out sick yet to date? No, that's why, I mean, the number 5,794 is pretty low. Most of the, most oh, okay. of the overtime this year to date is for the trades group, which is... Sean has two groups. There's the, the custodians and then there's the tradespeople. Those are the, okay. and they're the ones that have overtime because we need to get projects done at certain points in time. So they will work overtime to get projects done. Well, what projects do we have right now that they would have to work overtime when the schools are closed? 
Well, it's it, I'd, I'd have to get a list from Sean, but sometimes it's we just have, for example, if you're doing a plumbing project, you you want to get it done in a certain amount of time, so the plumbing isn't isn't tied up for a long time. But I could get a list of the of the of the overtime. That would be perfect. And I do apologize if I'm not catching the numbers. The laid out here isn't very good. So I do apologize. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, then we get down the, uh, you'll notice the longevity line, the 51600. That is the payment made per contract for all the uh, bargaining units, except for the paras. Um, as you can see, it's a higher number than we budgeted. It's higher than it was last year. Um, this year, we'll, we did a better job in budgeting because A, we got to budget after it was paid. Typically, we have to estimate what that is prior to it's being paid. Um, but that number is, is, the, is the correct number. Um, and then retirement and separation pay, as you can see, all the teachers are paid. That account will run over as we had a budget of 800,000. What's left being paid now is when people leave, for example, someone left in the human resources department, they had $4,000 of vacation accrued. So they were paid $4,000. So what you're going to see now is anybody that leaves that isn't a teacher that may have accrued vacation time. That's the, the cost that you'll see for the rest of the year there. Because I think the 13,000 was a, uh, a para, a secretary and, and a uh, HR person. Okay, uh, so that's salaries and wages, uh, fringe benefits. As I've always said, that's pretty much just estimates from the city that gets trued up at the end of the year. Um, professional and technical services. Um, as I've, you know, we've talked before, legal services is running very high. It continues to run high. Um, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it will continue to be high the next few months. Um, other than that, um, most of the other accounts, pupil support services, that's our OTPT services, uh, that sort of fits in with most of the other months. Contract services is, is, uh, fine. So those accounts, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. I think it's, uh, sort of what we're, what we're expecting. So on page two, um, property services. Now you'll notice electricity, both December and January are very low. I mean, we're typically paying closer to 140,000 or so on that line. Um, so we did have a holdup um, for a couple of weeks. Um, on some of the invoicing, it has now been caught up and entered. So you, in, the, in the month of February, we will see uh, those numbers go back up. Um, I expected it, honestly, to happen in January, but the invoices didn't get entered into the system until February. Um, the heating gas line, um, that also looked very low, 68, 69,000. Typically in January, it's a lot higher. Um, there, there was an, uh, an invoice for about 33,000 that was applied to the wrong account. If you look down a couple lines below it, you'll see building and grounds maintenance. Um, that's 43,000, it's quite high for that account in any given month. 33,000 of that 43,000 should have been up in the heating gas line. So it was one invoice that was was uh, applied to the wrong account. We have found that, corrected it, and it'll it's it's been adjusted today actually. So basically, that sixty eight is really thirty three thousand higher, and the maintenance is really ten thousand, not forty three thousand. Um, but what I mentioned about electricity, 
the, and the heating gas, some of those invoices are in February. So what you're going to see in February is, is much larger numbers in February for those two accounts. Um, the copier maintenance contracts, we pay those twice a year. Um, we pay for the first six months, then we pay in advance for the next six months, and then we true it up at the end of the year in June. So that's the second half of the payment, the 62000 it is lower than the first payment, but the provider realized that there aren't, the students weren't in, we weren't using copies anywhere near as high a volume as we usually do. So they took a little off that estimate. Um, and then other than that, it looks okay. There's a small amount in rentals. And that is uh, we, rented the Girls Incorporated gym for the Fairgrounds Middle School basketball teams because their gym is obviously under construction. Okay, other services. Um, telephone voice. I know this has been a question. Mrs. Odin has asked for a long time. We finally have a, uh, we're beginning an audit of all our telephone lines. Um, and I'm not 100% sure how long it will take, but hopefully uh, by the end of this school year, it will be completed and we will be able to um, reduce the cost in this line item going forward. Um, the With the new phone system, it's done over the network. Uh, we will keep at least two so-called copper lines for redundancy and if the system goes down, at each of the schools, maybe more at the high schools, um, but we're hoping to be able to discontinue a lot of those lines. Um, it's a kind of a complicated procedure to figure it all out, especially since we have so many different vendors that we pay phone bills to. Um, so it'll it'll be a good process and uh, come the spring, hopefully we'll have uh, some answers for that. Thank you, uh, and I hope we save some money as we, we thought we were going to do. Yes, I, I agree. Um, okay, the rest of those accounts, relatively small amounts, as you can see, um, not, not a lot of activity uh, during the January period till you get to the bottom, regular transportation services. That's, as, as you notice, that's the, uh, the buses that we're running. It's, it's quite high this month, but that's because December and January both hit in the month of January. You'll notice how low December was and how high January is. Um, same thing for the special ed transportation. You can see December, there really wasn't any invoice entered. They were, the December and Januarys were both entered in January. Um, and the tuition out of district, was also pretty low for January. So my guess is that number is gonna be much higher in February. The good news on that account, and I haven't had good news on that account in probably seven years, um, is it looks as though we're going to be about $300,000 less on this line than we were last year. Um, and it's not that the cost per student isn't continuing to go up, we just have fewer students this year. Um, I think some of that might be related to COVID where people aren't moving in and out as much, um, but a number of students did either turn 18 or graduate. So there was, and, and a few of those were um, higher priced schools. So, uh, and we haven't had the influx that we've been getting the last few years. So. No promises, because it could still happen later in the year, but it looks as though for the first time, we're going to be lower this year than we were the past two years. Okay, um, supplies and materials, nothing of real note there. Um, just re really nothing, nothing too much there, not much to say. Uh, the next is indirect cost. The other expenses, indirect cost, you'll notice a, a negative there of 63,000. Um, and what that is, is we're, we're finally all caught up on our grants. Um, 
We had fallen behind. The person that was doing them had left the district. Um, we've caught up. And uh, so that, that sort of brings us up to date. Based on what we're seeing in the CARES Act grant and other grants, we should have uh, excess, um, excess credit here, which is a good thing. We're already uh, above budget and where we planned on being. Okay, and then equipment, um, computer equipment, not much activity the last couple of months. Um, computer software, the same. We purchased most of that software up front. And that's about it. You'll notice obviously no debt service. The budget adjustments, typically those are the entries made at the end of the year. There are the two main things there are the facility rental, which we're not going to have anything. So that's $144,000 hit to our budget this year. And the other is the sports fees, which we won't collect what we budgeted. We will collect some sports fees, but we're certainly not going to collect what we budgeted. So those are a couple of the areas in the budget that I'll be, I'll be working, working uh, on to try to hopefully get some, some uh, savings in other lines. Any questions? If there's no questions, I'm gonna make a motion to accept the financial report for January, 2021. Second. So move. Oh, <laughs> this is Johnson votes yes. Ms. Oden? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, the next thing on the agenda is the January transfer report. Mr. Donovan? Okay, um, just to think of this, about five or so transfers. Uh, first one is the technology department, um, transferring some money from contracted services to supplies. Um, it says to purchase an APC. I asked what an APC is, and it's basically it's power supply. Um, APC happens to be the vendor name for the power supply. So that was some purchases of power, power supplies uh, that they needed for their network project. Um, the next uh, is a transfer. It's 175,000. Um, we received the one-time funds weren't, we made a purchase part of, let me get this. <laughs> we purchased the Amplify materials with the one-time funds, but when the Board of Aldermen budgeted the one-time funds, they put them in a contingency. So we had to then get approval from the Board of Ed, get approval from the Board of Aldermen, and therefore wait for the funds to be sent to us. We didn't wanna wait that long to get the materials. So we basically borrowed money from the electricity line and put it in to purchase the materials. Then when we got the contingency money, we put it in the account. This is just replacing that 175,000 back into electricity. So it looks like it's a big transfer, but it's really just adjusting the borrowing that we had done to make the purchase. Next one is a Penichuk, um, and they're moving some of their supply money um, to buy a few Chromebooks. Looks like about 10 of them. Um, not sure where, where they found 10 Chromebooks. We can't seem to find them anywhere, but they made the, the transfer request. The next one is uh, one from South, and they're moving office supply money into Ed Supplies and Contracted Services, small amounts of money. And the last one is um, transferring money uh, to legal services from electricity. Um, as you know, our legal costs have been much higher than budgeted this year. I've mentioned it a number of times on the reports. And so 
at, at some point in time, we have to transfer money from another account to cover those to pay the bills or the system. The system will do a budget edit and it won't let you pay the bill unless you've moved money into it. So this is the second entry we've made to legal this year, and there'll probably be more. Is there any questions, Mr. Donovan? No. Okay. Who would like to make a motion to trans to accept the fiscal year 21 uh, January transfer report? So moved. Thank you. Second by. Second. Okay. Mrs. Johnson votes yes. Ms. Oden? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. The motion carries. Is there anything else? Let's see, we covered everything on the agenda. Anything else for Mr. Donovan? Ms. Donovan, anything else you need to tell us? That's all I have tonight. Okay, Ms. Brown? Thank you. Nothing? Ms. Oden? No, no. motion to adjourn. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Second by Ms. Brown. Mrs. Johnson votes yes. Ms. Oden? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. And we're adjourned at 7.06. This is a good, quick meeting. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. Thank you, Thank everybody. Thank you, Mr. Donovan.